Hello everyone and welcome to the PV Technology Solar Storage and End of Life Use and Recycling webinar. This forms part of the Expo Training Series by the International Solar Alliance in partnership with Clean Energy Solutions Center and the Carbon Trust. So, an overview of the training course modules in this series. We've got eight different modules and an additional course, and this webinar forms part of the additional courses. And as I said, we'll focus on solar storage and the end of life use and recycling. So today's agenda, following the learning objective in the introduction, we'll look at the need for energy storage uh, with a solar PV plant or projects. And then looking into the solar PV storage technology types and the specifications and economics associated with each one. In chapter four, we'll give a few examples of solar PV combined with storage. And then thereafter, we start looking at the end of life management, um, including the, the treatment, uh, reuse potential, and ecological impacts associated with uh, the end of life of solar PV and of battery technology in particular. And chapter seven, we'll just run through the conclusions and key takeaways from this webinar. So let's get started. By the end of this webinar, we hope to explore solar storage technology options and the benefits and drawbacks for each of these storage technologies. And we want to provide an overview of the end of life treatment of solar PV equipment, particularly the solar PV panels and the storage facilities being battery technologies specifically and the potential development therein. So expanding the, the current practices towards best practice. All right. So what is the need for energy storage when combined with solar PV? Well, if we have a look here, we can see that the top diagram shows a demand profile or, or a demand load um, of, a, of a typical domestic application. And we can see it peaks in the mornings and especially a, a larger peak in the evening time um, between the hours of say 5 p.m. and 9 or 10 p.m. And we can see that there is a mismatch between the solar PV energy profile, the energy production profile, um, which then peaks midday and then tapers off in the, in the evening time and also has low efficiency and productivity in the early morning hours. Um, so from this mismatch, this is where the need for solar storage comes in to, to better match the demand profile with the supply profile. And that allows us to shift the, the PV energy produced um, so that it can be used during the peak demand times, being especially in the evening and in the early morning in some cases. Solar storage technologies, um, they do also help with the intermittent and uh, fluctuation characteristics of solar PV and also a, a few of the other renewable energy technologies um, wherein the, the power from these technologies is intermittent and the frequency control and the grid stability um, can become a bit of an issue with higher penetration levels of these renewable energy technologies. And solar storage and storage technologies in general help to, to stabilize the grid and provide better grid support um, to better manage these frequency and, and energy supply fluctuations, as well as reducing the need for peaker plants uh, based on oil or, or natural gas, which can at times be, be quite expensive. Um, and this is mitigated with storage technologies uh, as we, we looked at in the previous slide, where you can shift the supply, energy supply into, into the demand areas with the demand times. So these are some of the, the benefits that, that come from using solar PV with a storage component with it. 
and this is further reiterated in this slide where we look at a variety of the services provided by solar storage. So it's not just a energy storage uh, capacity. Um, while it does offer energy storage and, and a time shift, uh, a better matching of the demand profile, it also plays a role in the regulation and voltage support, uh, allows for black starts at, at a grid scale to, to fire up the, the base load energy technologies. These storage technologies help with getting them back up and running and a, a host of other support services that are provided, in, including increased self-consumption, uh, better demand charge management, uh, and a, a host of other support services that are provided by the storage technologies. So when looking at which solar storage technologies to consider, especially if we look at a sort of a project level, um, not so much in this webinar, at least looking at bulk power management, we are more focused on individual solar projects being paired with a, a storage technology. So if we have a look at this diagram here, it's basically comparing three different metrics or three different uh, parameters for each of the storage technologies. And we can see the bottom one being energy. So this is the, the energy storage capacity of the different battery technologies. Um, and this is differentiated from the power in that the power is sort of the rated supply at a given moment, whereas the energy is the capacity that the power can be delivered over. So if you have a one megawatt uh, storage power capacity and you can deliver that for, for 10 hours, then you'll have a 10 megawatt hour energy capacity for that technology. And so we can see here that for, for hydrogen and natural gas, uh, pumped hydro storage and compressed air storage, that, that cluster of, of technologies up in the right-hand corner, those are better suited to very large applications uh, with higher power capacities and that can provide power over a fairly long term in the, in the hour to days spectrum. And then we can come to the battery technologies, the lithium ion, sodium, redox flow batteries, lead acids, and, and, and other types of battery technologies, but mainly those ones. Um, they are sort of an intermediate where they operate from scales ranging from sort of the kilowatt scale right up into the tens of megawatts um, and even hundreds of megawatts there on the right side. Um, and spanning quite a range of power capacities again from the, the single single digit kilowatts up into the tens of megawatts, um, but not quite at the same scale as those other much larger technology types. And then over in the, the far left, we have the capacitors and, and other types of mechanical, the, the flywheel technologies, which are more suited to sort of high power, but very low, time spans. You can see it's between sort of seconds and minutes uh, operating there. So this is typically the, the frequency support, the grid stability support are provided by these those types of mechanical storage technologies. The batteries bridging between the, the, the large scale and, the, and, the, and that very small scale and suitable mostly to, to individual projects, which is what we're going to look at today. And then you've got the bulk power management up on the right. So we're going to look at solar PV combined with the different storage technologies here. And the reason that we have considered many for this webinar, the battery technology is due to it being a mature technology that is being deployed for a variety of applications around the world. Uh, we see that it offers developers scalability, as we saw on the previous slide going from the single digit kilowatt scales right up into the multi megawatt scales. It's got a high round trip efficiency and the logistics of it having fairly high energy and power density allow for these types of technologies to be deployed in fairly rural or isolated areas uh, better than some of the other larger, uh, more cumbersome technology types. Um, pumped hydro storage is, uh, typically used for bulk power management, as we said before, and 
has a very high upfront capex cost and will not typically be built for individual projects, individual solar PV projects. And the same can be said for compressed air storage, which also has a an added requirement for suitable geology in some cases if it's not housed in tanks above ground and it needs a fossil fuel source, which is usually natural gas to heat the expanding air once it's being released through the turbine, which uh, requires to have these fossil fuel feed sources or, or, or not necessarily fossil fuel, it could be a biogas, but you would need that uh, feedstock on hand, which, which is another limitation um, to consider. And then hydrogen storage, lastly, not really considered in this webinar due to the fact that it's still in its infancy. It's not commercially mature yet and is again applicable at the, the grid level, bulk power management level. So when we look at the battery technologies on offer today, uh, we can see that there are quite a host of, of different materials that are used, um, some of them more mature than others, and with varying specifications and costs associated with them. So we can see at, at the lower cost end of the spectrum, we've got the lead acid batteries, which are highly proven um, and in use in multiple applications around the world and have been for some time. Um, fairly good round trip efficiency between 70% and 90%. And very affordable if you look at the cost of energy in particular and the cost of power. Um, one of the most affordable types um, that we have, especially considering that it's been deployed in mass around the world. Um, another important one to look at, which is up and coming and starting to really find a lot of uses beyond just mobile phones or electric vehicles is lithium ion batteries, which have a high round trip efficiencies, one of the highest, the highest between these technologies. Um, however, the, the the trick is, or the, or the challenges that it's facing is to, to get the energy cost and the power cost down um, to make it feasible for solar PV integration and renewable integration at large. Um, another, one of the technologies considered today will be the vanadium redox flow, which we can see has a, a very deep depth of discharge, um, can run through many, many cycles and gives it a long lifespan, uh, more than the other two. And at large scale, it becomes more affordable. It's a very scalable type of technology, even though it's still not fully mature. It's, it's a very recent, it's, it's has commercial applica applications, but it is still um, much more immature uh, than the other two technology types. So let's have a look at some of the examples of solar PV projects that have been combined with solar storage, particularly battery storage. So at the very small end of the, the scale, we've got the Pico Solar and the solar home systems scale, which is typically between sort of one and 50 watts, um, maybe maybe 100 or so watts. And this is typically just for basic lighting, uh, charging of, of devices, and maybe a radio or a TV, depending on the size of the system. It is still considered too small for, for refrigeration and for um, HVAC or, or any kind of heavy energy intense pr processes here. Um, you can't really have appliances or, or, or large uh, energy users associated with it. So for productive energy, not really. It's mainly for basic electrification, uh, especially in rural areas that we're seeing in Africa with a variety of mechanisms that are being used as discussed in the other webinar. But predominantly for this scale, we see lead acid batteries are, are typically used uh, for their affordability and um, and the, the suitability of this technology to these smaller scales. Another example, more of a commercial and semi-industrial scale would be the use of battery storage for off-grid to telecommunication tower energy supply. And this is where we are seeing increasingly that uh, telecom towers and base transceiver stations, especially those in remote areas or difficult to reach areas are opting to 
use solar PV with combined battery storage technology because the grid in, in many cases is not available out in these areas. And in some cases, if there are, or if there is additional energy supply from the solar PV installation, this excess power and energy can be sold to neighboring houses, neighboring businesses, um, and used to for productive energy purposes there. Um, so this is sort of electrifying telecommunication towers primarily, and with the additional supply, giving electrification to the surrounding communities. And we saw an example of this, um, this off-grid electrification with battery storage being applied for refrigeration, uh, especially in Kenya, where there were fishing communities that prior to the energy storage and solar PV installation were losing up to a third of their, their catch to uh, wastage post-harvest and now with this energy installation with storage they were able to refrigerate their their seafood and could greatly improve their their revenues and reduce their waste as a result another larger scale uh, utility scale project has been developed in chad uh, 32 megawatts in the first phase uh, expanding up to 60 megawatts and this has been paired with a four megawatt hour battery system um, that is primarily used for network stabilization, uh, less so for the, the load shifting, uh, as we mentioned earlier, but to, to stabilize the grid and make sure that the frequency and the quality of the electricity coming through from that is, is matched and suitable for the grid there. We've seen utility scale solar PV combined with storage in developed countries. Uh, there are numerous cases available for that. Um, this is, is, is a good example of a recent and fairly large installation of the same type in a developing country such as Chad. Um, so we're seeing that this technology is now proliferating and becoming affordable and is actually being implemented in these developing countries. Um, all right, so after that brief overview of the technology types under consideration and the storage technologies that are available for solar PV. Uh, we'll have a look at the end of life of both the solar PV panels and the batteries. Um, starting with the solar PV panels, we can see that the majority of the installations to date, the majority of the solar PV capacity at all scales is primarily silicon based PV panels with about 10% penetration uh, from thin films. And the composition of these solar PV panels is predominantly glass, especially in the case of the thin film, and plastic and aluminium. And glass and aluminium especially are highly, highly recyclable materials. The plastic less so, um, and we'll go into that a little bit later, but we can see the metals also very, very highly recyclable, and the silicon, if, if extracted and isolated, can also be recycled with, with relative ease. So we can see that this is the, the makeup of the typical solar panel. By mass, typically, or by mass, it is uh, highly concentrated in the glass, plastic, and aluminium. Now, why is it important to consider the end of life of these solar PV components and specifically the panels? If we look at the, the bottom graph there, we can see the accumulated installation of solar PV and the projected forward to 2023. And we can see that it's, it's an exponential increase in the amount of solar PV capacity that's been installed in the recent years and forecast in the coming years. And with this increase in installation, there will be a huge end of life consideration as this, as these installations come to their end of life uh, at time. So by the end of 2016, there was between 43,000 and 250,000 tons of solar PV waste. And this is expected to increase to 60 to 78 million tons by the year 2050, as this capacity is built in. So there is definitely a, a need to consider this to avoid it just being disposed of at landfill and uh, not being reintegrated into the economy uh, and 
circularizing the, the solar PV industry. And there are also a fair amount of value in the materials that are within the solar PV panels, um, estimated at two billion, oh sorry, fifteen billion dollars in the materials um, in the year 2050. So it's an important consideration economically and ecologically, and it's going to become even more so in the future as capacity increases. All right, so in the recent years, we've seen that solar PV has become more efficient and the power production per panel has been, has been on the in increase. And from this, the, the panel mass to power ratio has dropped and the demand for these materials has also reduced as this power increases for each given material. And this is expected to sort of improve the, the the amount of waste going through to, to landfill or to be considered in future. But ideally, we do want to be looking at reducing the input, uh, reusing the panels or the components within there, and then lastly, recycling the, the materials within them and re feeding that back into the, to the processing route. Um, the least desirable would just be disposal to, to landfill sites. But without proper management and uh, regulation, this may be the case. And so this needs to be prioritized and it needs to be considered, especially going forward. And what we've seen is that in the reuse phase, there are power plants and installations where the panels that have reached the end of their life or the useful life have been returned, repaired and refurbished and then sold on again as uh, sort of reused solar panels at typically 70% of the original cost, which offers uh, potential for those that might not be able to afford uh, new panels to, to still enjoy the benefits of the solar PV power supply and potentially electrify themselves if they're unelectrified without the, the upfront costs of new panels, um, whilst also giving these panels a second life and reducing the end of life consideration. So when looking at the recycling routes for, for the two, we've got silicon panels on the left-hand side of this diagram and thin film panel recycling on the right. We can see that there's a variety of thermal, mechanical, and, and chemical processes that go on to, to isolate and recover the materials. Um, so mechanically, you can separate the glass from the rest of the panel. And that's typically seeing 95 odd percent of the glass recovered through through these mechanisms and also the metal recovery there. The issue that is currently being faced is the ethylene vinyl acetate, the EVA, which is the plastic component on the silicon panels. And that typically needs to be thermally burnt off from the from the panels. And those are not recoverable after after being burnt. They are incinerated and there are sort of emissions arising from that. And the, the, the fact that you can't actually reuse or recover that, that plastic uh, is, is a consideration going forward and, and is, is one of the more difficult materials to recover the plastic component there. Um, we can see that the metal, the glass, um, the modules, even if they're separated or etched away, can be recovered and reused. Um, it's mainly the, the, the plastic portion that is, is difficult to, to recover, but everything else is very highly recyclable. It just requires um, fairly intensive and, and potentially costly procedures to, to separate them and isolate them. And we can see the difference between the, the mask of each of the materials in the PV component in the PV panel rather, and the, the value of the, comp of the materials in there. So we had glass, which was comprising the vast majority of the mass, is now actually only accounting for 8% of the value being sold back into the, the manufacturing process. Um, the highest value item or highest value material in the panel is the silver, which comprises about 47%, according to IRENA and the IEA PVPS study, of the, the value of the recovered materials. 
So as I mentioned before, we, we need a, a regulatory environment and legislation that uh, drives the recycling, reuse, and the reduction in material consumption for the solar PV panels, especially as capacity is expected to increase dramatically in the future. And currently, we see that the EU is the only region with a dedicated PV component disposal and recycling legislation. Um, and that is under the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive. So solar PV panels have a specific uh, designation there, which requires them to be treated in a certain way and they must be recycled according to these regulations and guidelines. However, the recycling of solar PV components is not currently viable without charging an additional fee to the consumer or the provider, depending on how it is structured um, for the project. So it's not self-sustaining with just the sales of the recovered material, um, which is sort of one of the major challenges to, to increasing the amount of solar PV recycling currently. And these costs need to be subsidized externally through charging a recycling fee. But in recent years, uh, we've seen that a, solar, a dedicated solar PV panel recycling plant was established in France um, to do exactly that, to recover the materials and feed them back into the production systems. And this shows that the solar PV capacities in Europe and the, the amount of panels that are coming to the end of life has justified the, the need for a dedicated recycling facility. So there is development being done and underway in the solar PV recycling space, particularly in Europe, because it has the recycling directive in place. Internationally, there, there aren't other regions with a dedicated solar PV recycling legislation. Some jurisdictions are underway with their solar PV recycling legislation and regulation, such as Japan and the USA. Um, where there are in Japan, they've sort of detailed roadmaps and they are in the process of developing the legislation. It just hasn't been published to date. And in the States where you can see California and Washington have implemented bills to regulate the solar PV module recycling. But at a countrywide level, it hasn't been gazetted or officially written into legislation yet that how the solar PV components are to be recycled. Um, the same can be said about China, Korea, and India, uh, with varying degrees of regulations and legislation around solar PV panel recycling. However, it is seen that instilling regulation and solar PV panel specific guidelines and legislation on recycling and treatment and end, end of life management is becoming more of a consideration as these as the capacity increases, one, and two, as the number of projects reaching the end of life is going to become more of a consideration. All right. Now, considering the storage end of life management and particularly looking at the battery technologies, we can see here, we're not going to go into too much of the technical details of the, how the batteries operate, as that was done in, a, in, a, in another webinar in the, within the series. It's just to show that these, there are two broad types of, of battery technology, uh, the secondary and the, and the flow battery. And each of these use different materials, different metals in their, in their battery and they have different considerations for the end of life management, uh, depending on their toxicity, the cost to extract it, and the ease with which it can be separated and recycled. So the main technologies for the flow batteries on the commercial market are vanadium redox, polysulfide bromide, and zinc bromide batteries. We're gonna be looking at vanadium redox flow batteries in this webinar. And from the secondary battery category, we're going to be looking at lead, acid, and lithium iron. So in a study that quantified the ecological impact of re recycling the battery technologies that we mentioned here, 
we can see that lithium ion represents one of the lowest ecological impacts currently uh, due to the primary material extraction. So that would be the mining of the lithium currently not imposing too much of an e ecological impact compared with the other two. The lead acid batteries, we can see that there is a, a large contribution to the material reuse credit. So that is, if we look at the graph, that the 0 0.02 ecological points per kilowatt hour would be the impact if it weren't for the great recyclability and the current recycling rate of these batteries. But due to the recyclability and recycling rates that we've seen, it's been reduced to just over 0 0.010. So it sort of halved the impact just by reusing the materials and recycling a, a great amount of the batteries of this technology type. The vanadium redox flow here, we can see that it's got a much higher impact than the other two, um, especially with regard to the primary material acquisition. So that would be the mining and the refining. And there isn't much credit available for the material reuse due to the fact that these technologies are new and we haven't actually seen the uptake of recycling at large scales yet um, although that's still to be seen as this ma technology matures the toxicity of the electrolyte within the vanadium redox flow is is relatively low and it can be easily reused or upgraded to be reused uh, without much additional impetus from the manufacturing or without needing to dig out more vanadium, which would have uh, higher ecological impacts. So as we, as we just touched on briefly there, the lead acid batteries are highly, highly recycled currently, 95 to 98%. Uh, it's a very well-established industry and it's the only battery type that is, is actually profitable in the recycling sector. So you, there is no need for additional payments from the consumer or from the supplier of the battery technology in the recycling process because the recycling process generates enough income to cover the costs associated with the recycling. So there's no out of pocket um, fees for the suppliers and the customers. However, the lead is highly toxic. Um, and it has substantial human and environmental impacts if not handled properly. And we can see that in some cases, especially in the example of the Bangladesh solar home system program that was recently implemented, where the batteries were being recycled in informal recycling centers or facilities, and there was not much in the way of the health and safety regulation and environmental compliance with these informal recyclers, which represents a, a significant danger to the people themselves doing the recycling and to the environment due to the leaching and uh, emissions associated with the smelting of the lead out of the battery. And we can see an image of, of the smelting being done there without much in the way of health and safety regulations. So to counter that, the program offered a $5 incentive to the, the formal recyclers. Um, to be, enabled, to be able to compete with the informal recyclers and to collect the battery, the batteries from these off-grid installations and make sure that the, the batteries are being processed in an environmentally and health and safety compliant manner. So when looking at lithium ion battery recycling, there are seven major materials that, that comprise most of the economic value in them, uh, being cobalt, li lithium, copper, graphite, nickel, aluminum, and manganese. And these need to be extracted um, and, and reused. And these metals are highly, highly recyclable. The, the main challenge is separating and isolating them from the battery. Um, and that's where a lot of the cost and the energy that goes into the recycling of lithium batteries comes from and is why that this, even though these are, are in some cases highly valuable materials, the, the costs associated with isolating and recovering them from the batteries is still not at cost parity, which means that it still needs funding, out of pocket funding from either the suppliers or the, the customers in the recycling phase. <laughs> 
but we are seeing innovation within this sector within the lithium ion recycling using fairly low lock toxicity acids such as citric acid and phosphoric acid to leach out the the lithium from the batteries and this still needs to be to be developed going forward but it is expected that the the costs associated with lithium ion recycling will come down and 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 reach a cost parity as the cost of the lithium and the other materials increases due to the demand and as the recycling processes are made more efficient so that would be the recycling and now we look at an example of of reuse which is obviously more desirable than recycling in the first place and what was what's being seen is that electric vehicle batteries with 80 to 85 percent of their capacity um, are being reused in stationary applications such as solar pv projects or, or solar pv power plants and it's anticipated that 75 percent of the ev batteries that will be reused for stationary applications by the year 2025 which gives them a much extended usable life and defers the the end of life burden and reduces the end of life burden as these batteries have a, a longer lifespan with which to operate and we can see here this example here at the Juan Cref arena in Amsterdam where they use 250 repurposed lithium ion batteries from electric vehicles uh, mainly to provide frequency control and load shaving for the stadium uh, to reduce their energy bill and to increase or improve their frequency control and the, and the power quality from the solar PV panels. And by repurposing these solar, or sorry, these lithium ion batteries, it reduces the cost of these batteries for these installations where we can see batteries going for less than a hundred dollars per kilowatt hour as an energy cost versus when we saw them in the previous slide in one of the earlier slides it was around five hundred dollars per kilowatt hour so you can get a substantial discount when reusing these uh, ev batteries with still 80 to 85 percent of their original capacity vanadium redox flow batteries as we mentioned earlier are not that mature a technology and so there's not a large installed capacity with which to to work with and on which to base a recycling platform so while there is not much information and and insights into the the costs and the recyclability of vanadium redox flow batteries there what is known is that the batteries have very long lifespans when compared to the lead acid or the lithium ion and can run through many many cycles without reducing their efficiency or their capacity the electrolyte which is the liquid that stores the energy in these redox flow batteries is considered to be low toxicity and non-flammable uh, which are important considerations for end of life especially considering that these installations may be fairly remote and they may be done by informal recycling facilities as with the lead acid batteries in the Bangladesh program. And obviously a lower toxicity and low flammability makes these technologies or these materials more recyclable, easier to recycle without much ecological or, or damage to, to the people themselves that are doing the recycling. In recent developments, we've seen that vanadium has been able to be extracted from fly ash and oil field sludge, which reduces the need for primary or virgin vanadium and also reduces the overall ecological impact of the, the vanadium itself in the batteries. Um, so it's expected that progress will, will develop fairly quickly with vanadium redox flow batteries. And as it stands, the recycling rates and the recycling implications are fairly unknown but it's expected that the environmental footprint of and the environmental end of life considerations will be fairly low for this technology and our final remarks just looking through the the, the slides that we've just gone through <clears throat> 
in the at the end of the day the choice in the storage technology or the battery technology will largely depend on the costs and the specifications of the the storage technology um, for small electrification and pico solar and solar home solar scales you're looking more at cost and and accessibility which primarily reduce or primarily results in lead acid batteries being used for these installations whereas for for the larger scale um, very large scale battery storage installations we can see lithium iron or vanadium redox coming into play especially going forward as these technologies develop the solar storage not only offers energy shifting and better matching of the demand and the power supply it also gives network stabilization services and other grid stability services that that are are beneficial to the to the grid and to the project itself solar pv compa solar pv components are regulated in the european union according to the weee directive However, elsewhere, these legislations and regulations are still being developed and are yet to be implemented nationwide, although there are developments and there is progress being made in this regard. When we look at the different battery technologies and the end of life considerations for them, we can see the lead acid battery being highly recycled and with high recyclability rates globally and are the only technology types that are self-sustaining or, or profitable within themselves without the need for out-of-pocket fees to be charged. The same cannot be said of lithium iron or vanadium redox flow batteries, which are still developing their re recycling technologies and processes and need, need further development therein. Here's a list of uh, references used in this webinar and we'd like to thank you very much for for listening to this webinar and to the series and that's it thank you so much for listening goodbye